Right. So I, I planned these lectures, two lectures today, to most of them were giving background to what I, so, but sort of background at a technical level, to what I uh, talked about <coughs> rather untechnically on um, on Friday. Um, so at some point we should discuss about having maybe one further lecture. Well, that's when I can try, and try to pull everything together. So just want to reassure you, if what I'm saying today doesn't immediately seem to tie up with um, what you were hoping to hear about. Um, so to, the, the, this morning, <coughs> I'm going to talk about um, a paper with um, with uh, Song Sun. which is um, appeared about a year ago. It's on, it's on, on the archive. This is the number. <coughs> and um, the point of this is to, <coughs> um, to see that gromov hausdorff limits have, uh, uh, under suitable hypotheses, have algebraic structures. So, in Dow. This is the this is the, the sort of slogan. So we're 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 mainly interested in Kähler Einstein manifolds of um, or minor variants of that, uh, but it's actually, in a way, at least for me, natural to work more generally, uh, and so we consider the following hypotheses. Let's consider, um, let's consider compact complex manifolds, dimension n, fixed uh, with a, a positive line bundle, over it um, with curvature omega, should be a, a, a Kähler form on X. There's a Kähler. Um, so the, 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 the key hypotheses are first we can we will let the volume be. Less than equal to some number. The, the volume will be essentially an integer after you normalize because the, the Kähler class is an integral class, so the volume is bigger than some one essentially. Uh, and we want to suppose the volume is less than some fixed number v. Let's suppose that the Ricci curvature of this metric satisfies a fixed bound. Well, we could take any number here. And um, <coughs> finally, we want a non-collapsing condition <coughs> of a kind which um, appeared in um, talk of higher high uh, in, in the meeting of the weekend. But for all proper balls, for R less than the diameter of the manifold, the volume of the, the ball is bigger than some positive constant times r to the 2n, c bigger than zero. So let's consider the collection of all the fixed, the fixed um, v and c and n Let's consider the collection of all such uh, data. Let's call it, say, K, N, C, V, C. So we're, so we're, we're, we're really, secretly, we're interested in the Kähler Einstein case when obviously uh, this is satisfied with the you know, super, super no normalization of things. Um, 
this condition um, then follows. Well, so, so we're, in, we're interested. In, sorry, I should say in the in the in the primarily in the Kähler-Einstein case of positive Ricci curvature. So this um, volume non-collapsing condition then follows uh, automatically from a standard argument from Meyer's theorem, again as, as appeared in Hayo's talk. So if, if, if you have Kähler-Einstein with Ricci positive, then the, the non-collapsing is automatic for a for a suitable constant C, which you can calculate. This follows from the bishop Romov yeah. monotonicity property that, let's, let's so, so, suppose in the case of positive Ricci curvature, say, then um, if we take the volume of a ball about a fixed point of radius r and divide by r to the 2n, then this is decreasing. It's a function of r. So by, by Meyer's theorem, if we have a fixed, so the fixed Ricci curvature gives a bound on the diameter. So we have a fix, the, the volume is bounded below, essentially by 1, as we said. So the volume of a, of a ball of a fixed size is at least 1. So this bishop Romov condition says that small balls can't have very small volume. In fact, it's the same to replace this non-collapsing condition under the, uh, under the other hypotheses by a bound on the diameter, by the same kind of argument. But I brought, I brought this in because this, this volume monotonicity condition for balls is um, one of the crucial things that appears again and again in the you know, underlying the various arguments. So this is a hypothesis. So but what, what we want to say is, supposing we have any sequence of so xi in uh, of this kind, then by very general facts, there will be a, if we're going to take a subsequence, which we'll suppress, there will be a, a Gromov Hausdorff limit Z, which so I, I wrote down the definition of the Gromov Hausdorff distance in the, my uh, talk on Friday, so let's write down again. This, this is a very general notion for, for uh, it, arbitrary metric spaces, essentially. So this thing is initially a metric space in the sense we have the, in the sense of dxy distance between points and um, and the short form of the statement expressing this this fact would be that um, z is homeomorphic to a normal projective algebraic variety let's call it say x infinity so, so I, I mean a complex projective algebraic variety so this is a, this is a this is a say a, a short form easy to, to state um, but it's not. The, 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 there are better ways of making more precise statements, which are in, which capture more of what's going on. Um, one way I, I like to think is that if in, in this sort of metric space of Romanian geometry game, people are always talking about convergence of sequences, whereas in algebraic geometry, people like to talk about families over a base. So uh, you, you can think of it that way. If you think about, if you think about, take a model set, which is just a the countable set with an accumulation point. So this is just a set naught one 
doesn't really matter. It take, take any sequence converging to zero. So we've got this is our set S. <coughs> So it follows from, very easily from the definitions of gromov hausdorff limit that we can take the disjoint union of all the xi's and z <coughs> and think of this as a, take that and map it down in the obvious way to this set S and, and endow that with a topology, in fact a metric. So we can think as we got x goes to S where the fibers are xi and this limit, Z. <clears throat> so, uh, one, one slightly more precise statement would be to say that we can embed this whole picture in some projective space <clears throat> in, such, in such a way that Z maps to this normal Projective variety, and the maps on all the xi are given by some um, some fixed power of our line bundle L. Possibly after going to a subsequence. <coughs> so x xi embedded. some fixed k. Does that mean they all sit in a variety then? So you have an algebraic family? Or? Sorry? You got these isolated guys, so they all sit in one variety then? Or? <coughs> well, not, that, that's what we're, we're working around, is that we don't, we don't initially have any... That's what you're trying to get to. We're trying to get to, yeah. So this, this is a kind of a way of trying to say that. So another way we can say we can embed this this thing in the Chow variety, parameterizing sub varieties of projective space. That's another way of saying it. Or we could say the natural way you can define a sheaf, just but just a very general way, over uh, this limit <coughs> by saying a function. Well, you could first define a pre-sheaf. You would say uh, you consider on a little open set U. You consider. Um, functions which can extend extend continuously to functions that are holomorphic on all the xi's, where we know what that means. Then take the associated sheaf to that pre-sheaf, and then the statement would be that that sheaf defines the structure of a, an algebraic variety on the limit z. Or another, even more sort of high technology way, well, let's, uh, let's say what would be to. So let's go back. <coughs> so let's. To which I, I need to say something more about what's known about these Gromov Hausdorff limits. So, it, as we say, initially, this thing is just a, a metric space. It has no other structure from the, just from the definition. But a, um, a lot more is known, and we will need to, to use that in what we're saying. So. Let's start off by saying that what we know by, by work, uh, basic result of Anderson and also a, a general theory of Cheeger and Kolding, which we'll be a, a, appealing to uh, a great later, says that, in fact, Z is the union of two pieces the regular set R and the singular set S, where this is this is um, open, dense, and on this regular set, well, under the hypothesis, because we only we only said bounded Ricci curvature, uh, what we get is a we get we get a Riemannian metric, but not quite a, not quite necessarily a smooth Riemannian metric. We get a uh, a C1 alpha Riemannian metric. But in fact, so since we're, we're actually going to be interested in the kahler einstein case in reality, so you can ignore that, you could just think of this as a smooth Riemannian metric on the regular set. Um, 
So we have this small singular set, which we know, we know less about, where this has got, Haus, this has got Hausdorff co-dimension Um, real co-dimension, at least four. So we, we have, although so Z is initially just a very abstract object, we, we know in fact it's got a, got a dense open set where it's a, it's a standard Riemannian manifold, and then this singular set that, um, well, at least we know something the control of its dimension. It's small in the sense of house of dimension, but, but we should be careful that we don't at this stage, we don't know anything else about this singular set, really. We don't, we don't want to th imagine that this is a, a sub-manifold or anything. This could be a bizarre kind of fractal object or something at, at this stage, from what we know. In any case, just to, just to pursue the um, bit further, the different forms of a, ways of stating this result, what we get along with the, so, so we get a Riemannian metric, but we also get all the other structure that we started with on the, um, the regular set. So over the regular set, we have a, a nice line, holomorphic, we, we get a complex structure, and we have a holomorphic line bundle. And um, we can talk about, with, with a Hermitian metric, and we can talk about bounded holomorphic sections of L over the regular set. The algebraic structure on the limit that's unique is it's unique with other things. It's uniquely defined. The, the algebraic structure on the limit. Uh, yes, that's that's what I'm trying to convert. The, the, the way I wrote, sort of write down a sheaf gives a way of. That's right. Um, so so another way of uh, kind of saying things in a more fancy language is that um, for each k we can define R. So we said R k is bounded. Holomorphic sections of L over L to the K over R. So these things obviously form a form form a ring. If you multiply two bounded sections, you get a bounded section. And um, Using results of Chi Li, plus the other input that we're going to put in, says that this is in fact finitely generated. So, so plus the, the input from what we're going to do from later implies that this is finitely generated. So we could just define this 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 thing to be x infinity is just the prod of this R star. So as we can write down a formula, but it is the point. The, the the difficulty is to prove that this is finitely generated, so that it actually defines it the algebra. It's graded algebra, yeah. Yeah, it was graded by. Yeah. Yeah. So, I've, so I'm not sure. So there, there, there are various various ways you can make various degrees of sophistication in which you can interpret this, but I think the, the point's all clear. In any case, the, 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 the crucial thing to do is actually um, the thing that needs to be done. It's something which has been understood by, by Tian for many years, and probably by many people, but particularly Tian has explained over, over many years why this is the why there's a crucial thing one needs to establish in order to have all the have all this this uh, nice compatibility between the, the the sort of metric geometry and the algebraic geometry so given again given k and a point x in so I just x is just going to be a typical member of this set considering uh, we can define rho kx 
is um, it's the maximum of the size of S of X, where S is a section of L to the K and normalized so the L2 norm <coughs> is equal to 1. So maybe I, something I didn't, but I didn't say it right at the beginning, which is actually rather cr cr crucial to recall, we're considering this as a Hermitian holomorphic line bundle. And then we get a, that's how we get a compatible connection and a curvature form. So that's what we're using. Here, this means the norm on the line bundle. So this is, this is, to say that this is positive is just to say there's a section that doesn't vanish at the given point. But the crucial thing that we want is to get kind of a uniform positivity on this over all manifolds in our class. So the essential, so the essential theorem is to say there exists some K in fact, we can take k to be arbitrarily large, given any number we can take a number bigger than that, such that, and, um, and b bigger than zero, such that rho kx is bigger than equal to b for all x in x and x in our class. So, universe, we get a, for, for large enough k, we get a kind of a universal lower bound over all things we're considering. So when I, when I said input from later, that this is what I really meant, that Chile proves that if you know this, then you get this finite generation condition. So most of the consequences of this are, in a sense, fairly stat or are things people have known how to do for quite a while in some form. Um, the crucial thing is to prove this this lower bound. Which is a kind of an effective form of saying that the sections generate the line bundle. You see we what we know is that what we know is if we take a fixed X, then indeed at any point indeed we can take a large enough k to make this positive, but we need to do that in this kind of uniform way. Have I said that? Is this all making sense? Should I, should I carry on? So, so let's, let's just dive in and talk about the proof of this, which is really the heart of the matter, and then come back to say something about how it, Im how it implies the other things. So the proof will combine really two things. Uh, one is this uh, theory that from these people I just <laughs> maybe I rubbed off. This sort of th mainly due to Cheeger and Colding about the convergence theory of manifolds under Ricci curvature bounds. And the other is um, um, in complex analysis, complex geometry, it's called the, the, the L2 or Hormander method for constructing holomorphic sections, holomorphic objects. So we, 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 we want to combine those, those we, we put those things together and basically the arguments beyond that are all this of an elementary nature, really. So I want to review the L2 technique first. <coughs> technique. So initially, just in, in the simplest possible setting, of how we, how we would prove from first principles the, the fact that I stated about we have a positive line bundle, then indeed take a suitably high power, we do get sections that 
simply vanish at a point. So let's, so let's now fix x, fix a big x at a point in x, and we want to construct a section L to the k with s of x non zero. Well, there's one, one very basic thing to see. It's, it's obvious, but, but um, a very uh, important thing to understand. What is this, what is this uh, sort of, uh, algebraic geometers are quite familiar with saying, we take, a, take big powers of a positive line bundle to do things. What does that mean more in, in terms of uh, well, the metric geometry? Th this corresponds to a scale factor. If we change L to L to the K, that corresponds to changing our, our k to form omega to K omega. So as we're scaling the, the, scaling the metric, uh, in the sense of the distance between points, by a factor the square root of K. The sense that we so if we draw a picture, we want to think about our point of x. We want to think now about we've expanded the manifold out by some large amount. So now, so if we take a sort of a little, little ball about x, now this expands out to some huge ball. And a, in this expanded thing, a unit ball goes down to a ball of radius 1 over root k about our point. So our constructions are going to be, as you'll see in a moment, essentially localized on these little ball around our point, which, but when we rescale, that'll become this, this standard size ball in x. So, of course, what we know about a, a Riemannian manifold is if we take a small ball and scale it up, it becomes approximately flat. And that's, that's the basic thing we know. So let, let's, for simplicity, uh, is, we're just reviewing the idea here. Let's suppose that, in fact, our metric actually was flat, precisely flat, in a small neighborhood here. So that when we do this rescaling, this is now isometric to a ball in Euclidean space, in our standard scale. In reality, of course, that won't be true, but it'll, it'll deviate by a small amount, so it'll just be a small extra error term, which won't really cause any difficulty. So we should... So that's the first idea, then, is this scaling idea. The second idea is then to focus on the, the flat limit Supposing we just take Cn with its standard, let's say omega, standard flat metric. Um, it doesn't seem very interesting, but let's think about, we, we should think about a line bundle C over Cn with a metric whose curvature is omega, of course. And that that's then becomes perhaps a bit more surprising in a sense, it's the same thing. Well, what you then find is that I mean, this will be the trivial line bundle, uh, but we're going to change the metric so that the, the trivializing section does not now have norm 1, but will be Gaussian. So we have a section, let's call it, say, sigma naught, Um, but, the, the, but the norm of sigma naught as a function on Cn will be e to the minus z squared over 2, this Gaussian thing. That's just saying that you know, all we're saying is that d bar d of mod z squared over 2 is the standard, this is, this is the Kähle potential for the, the standard metric, that's all we're saying. <coughs> Uh, 
So this is this is just a different language for what. And if, you, if we look in, say, Hormander's book, uh, would be expressed in terms of weight functions, rather than to, rather than taking holomorphic functions on C n and taking the standard L two in a product, which of course would not work very well because it would never be finite. Then we take the weighted function, weighted by this Gaussian factor. So talking about weight functions is just the same as talking about the line bundle with a emission metric. Just make another. <coughs> so CF weight functions. <coughs> so now we can um Say it. So we, 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 we want to restrict to a big, a, big, a big ball of radius r, say. The r is some fixed, well, some, some large number that we're going to fix very soon. <coughs> um, a, a way of expressing what we're doing is that we can take a map chi from b of r to x And when we pull back, when we take the kth power of our line bundle, pull it back by this map, this is a holomorphic map, but also this map will be a, an isometry of the rescaled metric, and we can lift it so that we also identify the line bundles over the same thing. So we can think of, we can think of uh, studying our line bundle L to the K over this ball is just the same as studying our standard line bundle over some pink ball in CN. And we have this so we can transplant sigma naught to a section of L to the K over this ball, the obvious way, using this isomorphism. <coughs> so regard sigma naught as a local section of L to the K. So in a moment we're going to start breaking down norms of things and so on. So it's really better, I think, to, to work with the rescaled norm. So we, we, we had, we would always work with the rescaled metric on X. So this, this thing really is a, an isometric embedding, what we're doing. So certainly, this is a, this is a, a, a this is a local holomorphic section which doesn't vanish at the, the point we started with, the, the origin. Uh, what we want to do is roughly speaking to extend this to a holomorphic section over the whole of X, which of course we can't do precisely. But um, the wonderful thing about these L2 te technique is it shows that you can do that. You, you essentially can do that with a very small adjustment. You can do that. What we do is we get it, we take a cutoff function of a standard kind. So um, let's draw a picture. So this this is a picture of our Gaussian function. We take our we have our large number r, which is a, the moment we're allowed to vary. We take some cutoff function of any, of any kind of standard kind. We'd like. So we can consider beta r sigma naught. Uh, we extend by zero over x. So this, 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 is a, com, com, this is a function vanishing outside the arbor, as indicated. Um, but of course, it's not holomorphic because we, we've got this cutoff function. So what, what we're going to then define is, say, S is pi of beta r of sigma naught, where this is L2 projection to the holomorphic sections. And this is certainly something we can write down. This is just a, 
the whole of the session is to find dimensional vector spaces, all we're working in over, over this compact manifold. We can certainly make this L2 projection, and certainly what we get is a holomorphic section. Um, but of course, just from the, the, the symbols on the board, we can't say anything about it. It could be zero, from just from the symbols on the board. So the crucial thing is to say that actually, this projection doesn't do very much. That this thing is almost the same as the thing, as the thing we started with. <coughs> So what, what we're really saying is, essentially, this Gaussian is compactly supported. So, because it's not exactly, if it, if it were compactly supported, we would just have been home <laughs> straight away. Of course, it's not exactly compactly supported, but we can get around this, because of the very rapid decay, we can get around that. So how does that go? The standard kind of Hodge theory gives you a formula for what this L2 projection is. Um, so S is going to be beta R sigma naught minus um, tor, where tor is d bar star of delta d bar to the minus 1 of, let's, go, let's call this thing sigma 1, let's call it sigma a little better. So this, this, this is sigma 1. This, this, is, this is a standard, I mean, assuming, that, of course, I need, I need to justify, as I was in a moment, why this, this, operate, this Laplace operator is invertible. If it is, this is the Hodge theory formula for that L2 projection. So this is what we're considering the D-bar complex on sections of our line bundle. And this is, this is the Laplacian of the usual kind, d-bar, d-bar star, plus d-bar star, d-bar, on the zero, one forms. So, we want to know, this is, the, we, want, we want to know, first of all, this is well defined, I, this, 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 this thing has got no kernel, the plus has got no kernel, but also, we want actually a, a bound on the operator norm of this thing. That's, what, that's the crucial thing we want. Uh, but why do we get that? We get that from a, from a Bochner Weizenbach formula. <coughs> which, which runs in the form delta d bar is some other, well, a certain other p star p for a certain other first order differential operator p plus um, a term from the Ricci. Um, plus one. So here, what do I mean? So th the point about this is just this is going to be positive. That's all we need to use. But we don't need to know the details of what this is. By Ricci, really, I'm working here with the rescaled metrics. So this is really one over k times the Ricci curvature we started with. But the Ricci curvature we started with is bounded. So this is uh, this is definitely bounded, and this is even smaller. So. Um, and then the one is really the curvature of this, it's the curvature of the line. After we've rescaled, the curvature of the line bundle is the Kähler form. That's the one that comes in. And this is essentially just the, um, it's just the same formula as in the Kodara vanishing theorem. Just, it's just the same thing. The fact, the fact that you get this, you get the, so as far as Ricci over K, so Ricci, this is original Ricci, so what we're saying is that whatever, whatever Ricci was, when k is sufficiently large, it would be killed, dominated by this one. In any case, what, what, that, what that shows is that the operator norm of this, the L2 operator norm, is less than equal, by making, we can suppose, is by making k sufficiently large, is less than one half, say. So. Or two, say, or something. <coughs> so 
It always seems like, a, I mean, it's a, it's a completely elementary thing, but it seems like a, a, a miracle to me that you don't reconstruct this inverse, or well, we, 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 know, we get the existence of this inverse with a definite control. We get a way of solving the, the Laplace equation with definite control, but we don't actually do any solving, we just write down this formula for the, for the, um, <laughs> this sort of inequality. So, well, for k, yeah, so we'll take k bigger. We said Ricci was less than one, so k is going to be bigger than two or some, some number. Yeah, but in general, it will be sufficiently, uh, yeah, k will be sufficiently large. Yeah. Well, it's sufficiently large and you know how big that is. Well, yeah, but under our hypothesis, we know exactly how big. Yeah. The volume form is always the original parameter. No, everything's rescaled here. I, I, I always want to rescale. Uh, all the formula I'm going to write down for the rescaled metric. That's the easiest way of them. Um, but it is invertible for any k, uh, I would say, more than one. Each was uh, bound by, bounded by one, yes? Yes, well, the one was arbitrary. But I mean, I, 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 one was, I could have put ten. I, I, the one was really arbitrary. The point is that once k is bigger than some definite number, this thing is, satisfies a definite bound. So, um, this means we get a, if we take the L2 norm of tall squared is, um, what is that? It's this d bar star delta to the minus one d bar of sigma one d bar star delta to the minus one d bar of sigma one. We can take um, we can take we can take this across, put it here, and then it cancels with the delta to the minus one there. And so this is less than two times the norm of d bar of sigma one squared. But this thing, so this thing, we can make very small, because what is what is the d bar of what is sigma one? Remember, this is just um, beta r times sigma naught. D bar of sigma one is d bar of beta r times sigma naught. So the size of it is this. <coughs> the derivative of beta r only happens. Out here, so radius say roughly r, r over two or something, where the size of sigma naught is e to the minus r squared. So this is essentially e to the minus r squared, or something like that. So by making r large, but not very large, we can make this a tiny number. So what we're saying is that we make the the adjustment in L two that we have to make is it can be make it a tiny number. It's by making R quite a, a moderately large number R. So why did why did, so that now we, we have our redrawing our picture. A sort of schematic picture of our Gaussian section. Now we know that we've slightly adjusted. We, we, we now have got it all over the manifold. We've got some sort of slightly adjusted thing, which actually is a holomorphic section. Uh, at this point, we only know that the difference is small in L2. But if we restrict to, we, 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 want, to, we want to get a pointwise bound at the point we started. We want to know the difference is small pointwise, but it's in fact less than one, so that our section is still non-zero. But if we restrict to a, uh, some fixed size interior ball, then Tor is holomorphic. <coughs> yeah? Because, because we're not seeing the cutoff function when we restrict to that thing. So, we, we, by standard elliptic estimates, the L2 norm over this thing controls the, 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 the pointwise norm, the, the, the C0 norm. So if we, if we um, again, if we make our, we should need to choose our R 
sufficiently large to fit in with the, the constant in that elliptic estimate, but then we can suppose we can get the, the, the norm of Tor at our original point we started with is uh, less than one tenth, say, or any any number we choose, right, adjusting our parameters. Yep. So so the section does indeed have size essentially one at this point. Okay, so this is everything for time. This is this is all the review of what is um, basically very well known to experts. Okay, so I can I can see it. I'm not going to. I'll, I'll be carrying on with this first part in the in, in the second session this afternoon, but that's fine. So let's begin on putting. Let's begin on doing what we really want to do, which is just obtaining this uniform band uh, over all our class of manifolds. So let's now uh, review the uh, chica colding theory, or some, uh, I'm, I'm not, not expert in this, but so re review some small parts of it that uh, we want to refer to. So the, the crucial thing is the existence of tangent cones. That's to say, for the gromov hausdorff limits of the kind that we're considering. So if we take a point, say, P, in sorry, Z, then we can rescale the metric and we can also rescale the metric by, uh, by a sequence of factors, by sequence, let's say, um, Ri tends to infinity. But, but we can, uh, after rescaling, we can restrict to sets of fixed size centered at z. So we don't explain this very well. So this is a, this is a schematic picture of our p and z. We can, we can uh, take a, something of, say, unit size and expand this out to size <coughs> Ri. And the same, the very general compactness theorem uh, says that when you do that, after taking a subsequence, you uh, get convergence on, on bounded sets. If we fix any number, after rescaling, we converge on balls of a fixed size centered at our base point, P. And the crucial, so, so the, the crucial point is that the limit is a metric cone. So this is a this is this is a sort of a deep technical theorem. I think it's it's sort of it's not hard to see roughly why this ought to be true from the uh, volume monoticity, the uh, volume of b of r over r to the n decreasing. 
um, I mean, it, it follows from this that this thing is a this thing is a volume cone. In other words, the vol. If we take this limit, then the vol of B of R is equal to a constant times R to the two n. And uh, at least in starting with straightforward situations, when you examine the proof of the Bishop Gromov, you see that actually, if this is constant, then the thing has to be a cone. The, the, the inequality comes precisely from the deviation of the metric from being a cone when the Bishop Gromov inequality. So the, this, the, the, the fact that you get these metric cones coming out, it's not, it's not too hard to see that it's plausible, but the, the precise proof is um, much harder. Okay, so we want to take it as a, as a, um, a known fact. Uh, but we should be aware that these, this, um, these tangent cones are not, are not in general known to be unique. So we're not, we're not saying whatever sequence you take, you get the same limit. You could, you could, in principle, take different sequences of rescalings and get different limits. But actually, that's not going to matter in what, we, in what we do, luckily. And probably, a, post a posteriori, after we've proved that these things are, these algebraic structures, it, it may well be possible to prove that the tangent cones are unique, but that's another thing. Uh, um, so also, we have some structure theory for these um, for these tangent cones, just like the structure theory we had um, we, 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 we described before uh, in the ordinary limits. So we have some singular set. Say sigma y in y, uh, and um, outside this singular set, essentially we have a smooth Riemannian metric. Really, we should say C1 alpha, but, but no, actually it is. Smooth. I think it is even smoother in this situation because we've, we're scaling Ricci down to zero. So we have a we have a sort of. Uh, so this is this has got this is uh, closed Hausdorff codimension. equal to 4, and uh, we have a, say, a smooth Riemannian metric outside sigma y. So we were saying, if we look at, it, if we look in, at, at a very small scale in our uh, gromov hausdorff limit, scale it up, what we're going to see is essentially this this, uh, this, cone, this metric cone is going to have some singular set. It's a small singular set. It's just, it's just symmetrical. This singular set is this. But outside that, we have a, a genuine metric cone in the usual sense. So, uh, away from this singular set, we can do, we have a, a kind of a st standard and straightforward different geometric picture. We have a we have a line bundle. We have, we have the trivial line bundle we can define over. Um, we call it say the cone of y minus the cone on sigma y. A Hermitian line bundle um, with a section. Uh, a holomorphic section with, with the same Gaussian decay. Where this is just notation for the distance to the vertex in the cone, the obvious notation. 
So this, 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 this line bundle, has a, a, this emission homomorphic line bundle has curvature, the, K, the Kähler form, there's a, there's a complex structure here, the curvature is the Kähler form defining the metric on the cone. So again, we, we want to really work with the bit we know where we have this nice differential geometry. So we're going to, um, we're going to do a bit more complicated cutting off this time with three parameters. One, we're going to take a large radius, say R, take a small radius, say delta, and but then, we, we, then we've got this singular set, so we'll take a, a neighbourhood of this singular set, say the eta neighbourhood, and remove that. So let's, let's call this, say, u equals u of delta r eta. That's, that's, this, is, this, is now a this has now got a smooth Riemannian metric, a complex structure. This is cone structure. It's what's called a, um, what's called a Sasaki-Einstein structure, is what it would be called. Then we have this, we have this um, homomorphic line bundle, that trivial homomorphic line bundle, with this Gaussian decaying section. So, um, so in a few moments I'm going to stop, but maybe I should ask any questions about what I've... Is there anything I've said not... Something I can usefully say now to clarify <laughs> what I've said? So, 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 so what you're doing now is you're sort of trying to understand what the sections look like near the singular points here. Um, uh, it's not going to be quite... What I'm doing now is I'm... Uh, It'll come in the next in the next paragraphs. It will be clear why I'm doing it. <laughs> but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm I'm getting a nice region in our in our cone in which we can do differential geometry, and where we have this holomorphic section. This smoothness is one alpha. Yes, alpha is positive. You said which? How smooth this metric? This 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 delta. This uh, is good part. Oh, uh, well, C1 alpha? Well, it's... Uh, alpha. Oh, alpha. Well, I ignore alpha. <laughs> I mean, if, in, fact, in fact, when we've done this rescaling, I think we can get C infinity, because, in fact, the metric here will be Ricci flat, so... So you have curvature of everything, yes? Yeah. But you, so use, you are working only with linear operators. Hmm? You are working only with linear operators. Uh -huh. You don't need full curvature, do you? No, we're... we're we're, we're just we're just saying we want to fix a nice region where we stay away from the singularities. That's what we're doing in this cone. We have this we have this this metric cone, but the the base of the cone itself has got this singular set. So we're fixing this nice region depending upon these three parameters here. When you say this eta here, it corresponds to the Sasaki Einstein structure. So this is corresponding to the Sasaki form. Sorry? Your eta, your choice, of, you said that this will give you a Sasaki-Einstein structure. Right, a Sasaki-Einstein structure is precisely a, an Einstein on a manifold on a cone. So a way, if we remove the singular set, yeah. <laughs> it's just what you've got. It should correspond to the Sasaki form or something. I mean, I'm just wondering your notation suggesting. Well, the Sasaki form will be essentially d of this, um, uh, or something like that. That'll be the, that'll be the Sasaki one. For, yeah. That would be a like, Sasaki. Yep, Sasaki. Okay, well let's let's stop. Does that make sense to stop now? And then I'll start again to explain why why we're doing this. But the, but, but well, let's just say well, let's just say I'll say it now and I'll say it again. Supposing we have 
now some cutoff function. We have a, a cutoff function of r as before, say beta r. We're going to have a cutoff function uh, depending on delta, something that vanishes in this thing and is equal to one outside distance two delta. And then we want a cutoff function on y, which um, is equal to one outside this eta neighborhood, or, or, sorry, supporting this eta neighborhood and equal to one outside a slightly larger neighborhood. So beta, beta say. So we have our section sigma naught, and we can consider this thing. Yeah. Just, well, just, just, just say, just say, multiplying by a compactly supported function, we can, we can do that. Thing. So, if we can embed this u in a uh, essentially isometric and holomorphic fashion inside our x, then we can do just the same thing as before. We can regard this sigma one as a section defined over x, not quite holomorphic because of these cutoff functions, and then use the same L2 projection to construct, to, just, to do just what we wanted to do before. And that's what we're going to do. But let's, let's stop now and um, take that up again in the next lecture. <laughs>